Oh, hello. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to our session for today. Uh, I'll be talking about building uh, privacy-aware AI systems uh, and teams. Uh, my name is Faris Hassan, and uh, the points that we will uh, talk about today is the utility privacy trade-off, how our AI systems and applications uh, present uh, a greater utility, but it comes at a uh, cost of privacy to some extent. And we will talk about the privacy by design concept. How can we build in privacy into our AI systems? And thirdly, how can we enhance privacy while uh, preserving utility? What kind of techniques are there that are used today? And to some extent, what is the mechanism of implementing them? And at the end, a best practices uh, to enhance privacy uh, into the organization culture and the team. Okay, uh, my name is Faris Hassan. I'm the lead data scientist in Carson Group. Uh, in Carson, we we are basically an e-commerce for second-hand uh, second uh, cars. And yeah, and uh, we serve two kind of models where we are serving the B2B sector where there are cars sold to uh, uh, other companies or dealerships and there's the B2C. And among all of that, there is a lot of uh, details that we deal with for users, uh, dealers, and car informations that we have to preserve and uh, protect uh, at all times. Uh, for uh, the, the bigger time of my uh, uh, career, I have been building recommendation engines and data uh, or customer-facing data products. Okay, uh, so for the last decade, there's a high emphasis uh, put into extracting value uh, from data. Uh, and maybe from, from earlier time, we heard about uh, big data in early 2010, 2011 and 12, and how certain companies are using it until where we are today, where it's not uh, anymore just about big data and it's not anymore about the big organization but it's almost every startup will have some form of data strategy there are three values that uh, uh, to keep it short that uh, will basically uh, present the value that we are talking about uh, one is uh, there is a lot of untapped potentials that can change the company uh, strategically uh, and there is a growing belief among organizations that uh, there is untapped value in the data they have. Uh, an example of this I have about uh, iFlix, a content streaming company uh, or startup here in Malaysia. And they started as somewhat uh, a copycat of Netflix, you can say. And along the time, based on the data of their viewers and their audience, they discovered that their audience are... Uh, watching or you can say there is a higher demand for certain genres at certain types of content which building on, on basically this discovery the company have changed its uh, direction and the platform became more into uh, basically the fact that their users are uh, are interested on specific type of, of content more of Asian uh, 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 content and uh, movies. And uh, this is a, an example. And there are so many where companies, they started as one thing. And later on, a few years down the road, they discovered that they have to actually uh, change and uh, there is a demand they can tap into. Uh, another uh, kind of value we can see clearly is personalization. Uh, data is leveraged to enhance and customize the user experience in so many uh, ways. In our shopping today, we will see all of these uh, algorithms and carousels 
actually presenting to us products and content and videos of things that we are most likely interested in. And uh, third, uh, most of the organizations today depend more on data analytics to their uh, or to make a decision or to aid their decision making. So all these uh, different kind of values from data require different level of granularity and different uh, level of uh, detail. <clears throat> but uh, when if we will see this uh, clearly in terms of uh, a utility, there there are basically a hierarchy of detail th that the more we know, there is a greater utility. And the more we know, we see how that give companies and organizations an intimate level of details uh, about, uh, about individual customers. The, the example if we if we look at the lowest level we will look into uh, data in general and uh, but on top of that if we know more about where do user click what they view and if we have more personal details about their demographies if we know how much they spend uh, the, uh, and where they live and uh, for example the phone they use and so on we might be able to predict more uh, of uh, about their pocket size. And the more details we know, now it, it basically unleash uh, a new possibilities of what can be built. Uh, for example, recommendation engines can uh, recommend products of uh, not only the same category or the same uh, type that the user most probably interested in, but also what the user might be able to afford and if you have even more you can look at uh, applications like dynamic pricing where some of the companies will not uh, basically sell the same product for the same price to everyone they will actually know for certain user if they are able to pay more so there will be like a margin that these algorithms will suggest because of the level of details and uh, they know about this user. So here you can see at one side that there is a greater utility that comes with the more knowledge and the more intimate details that we have. And in the same time, it becomes somewhat, uh, somewhat invasive and somewhat uh, comes at, at the cost that these companies might not even be able to protect uh, this uh, data. So here comes the, the utility privacy trade-off. Companies will want to know more about you to offer you good uh, or, or to offer you better services, to customize your experience, to give you things that uh, basically make your life better. Uh, for example, instead of you looking at hundreds of products before you find the one that you like or the set of products that you might choose from, companies, if they know enough about you, they will give you that set of 10 products that you most likely to pick one from. Uh, but in the same time, uh, this knowledge is basically, this knowledge is basically, uh, you can say there, uh, it might be used in different applications than what it's collected for, or it might be uh, vulnerable to preach and hacking and leakage and so on where other parties might be using it in a completely uh, uh, different way that could go against uh, the user or the customer interest. But in, in all of this we can have uh, uh, you know, maybe some disagreement that okay if the platform is uh, is going to predict to me good products and so on, I am okay with these details. But in the same time, uh, if the platform will go to give me, or for example, it will have some dynamic pricing layer that might overprice products for me just because they know more that I can pay, then it goes against your interest as a user. Uh, and for to look into privacy, there is there is always this confusion where 
where where do the the privacy lies is it in them protecting this data from breach and hacking or is it protecting it from being used for something else other than the thing that you subscribe to and uh, for that uh, i would like to be in the same page by looking or considering this uh, definition of information privacy by the international association of privacy professionals where it defines information privacy as the right to have some control over how your personal information is collected and used and what does that mean is that uh, you should have the right that uh, basically that protects you from uh, or protects your data from being used for other purposes or being sold or being given to third party that you did not uh, consent to in the first place <clears throat> there are three main solutions that can address uh, uh, these uh, these threats into privacy. So, in the first level of of threat that I think most of us are familiar with today is uh, safeguard access, or basically a privileged, uh, uh, multi layered uh, privileges of access where not everyone will have the same level of access to the, uh, to the data. Uh, let's say, for example, if, uh, if there is a, an engineer in the company, they, uh, my, they shouldn't be have an access, for example, to personal level data or to, for example, financial level data and uh, so on. So a user must have access to only data that they need to do their job and they shouldn't have more privileged access. And in the, in the case where uh, employees move to different, uh, uh, to different department, their permissions also change to reflect uh, basically access to the data, to the, only to the data that uh, they need. Uh, the second solution is to look into privacy to be part of the design of the products. It is a, a philosophy that basically looks into embedding, instead of looking at privacy as something we do later on, on the data, in the age of AI, the paradigm that uh, should take place is that privacy should be built into these products and services and infrastructures. And uh, last, there has to be some way where we can balance the utility uh, that we that companies can get from personal data and still maintain and, pre, uh, and uh, preserve privacy protect, uh, protection there are uh, there are several techniques uh, that are used uh, for for each for privacy uh, by design there is there are seven principles that uh, comes into this. And these principles all uh, goes into the direction that how can you make uh, privacy part of your design? Uh, one is that privacy should exist before any privacy invasive event happens, not after the fact. So it should be in the design early on uh, it should be a proactive uh, recipe, not a reactive to a certain breach, and it should be preventive of uh, of certain uh, of certain breach or misuse and and, and so on. So privacy should uh, basically pre-exist before there is any event uh, that uh, could happen. The second principle is that privacy should be the default set, uh, setting. There is a respective of. Uh, basically any action, even if uh, the user is inactive, the privacy should be maintained for this user regardless. And uh, third principle is to be transparent and have visibility. And uh, basically the, custom, the, the system operations and, comp uh, and components are visible to stakeholders and users. They know why this data uh, are uh, are collected uh, or how they are collected and the components of the system uh, basically be visible even uh, to the user. <clears throat> the fourth principle is to have an end-to-end -end security. So 
uh, end-to-end security means that ensuring the security of the data throughout uh, its life cycle before collection, when it's collected and at the a time of data is being deleted or uh, 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 gotten uh, read off. <clears throat> the fifth principle is the embedding privacy in the design. So components of, of the products that, uh, that delivers information should maintain uh, the privacy of the individual, should maintain uh, or obscure basically access to, the, to this data from uh, anyone else uh, inside or, uh, or as a, from the other users of the platform or even from uh, within uh, the, 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 the developer or the team that develops the solution. The sixth uh, 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 principle is to have full functionality. And full functionality means that because we are trying to maintain privacy, we shouldn't be believing or have the false belief that privacy means uh, we will have, for example, less offering or our service will not be delivered in the same quality. And uh, so uh, it, it changes basically the mentality from having a zero sum into a positive sum relationship. Business can have both privacy embedded in the design with full functionality and full delivery of the service. And in the same time, uh, uh, and, and the same time maintains uh, utility and maintains the level of uh, the service that is offered. Uh, the fifth uh, or the seventh principle is uh, to respect the privacy of the user and make it a user centric. So keep the developed products and services user centric by providing information to the user about their data, offering privacy by default. For example, if a user uh, want to opt out of the platform, uh, they should have uh, for example, they should have the choice to get all their data and uh, they should have the choice that their data be deleted uh, from the platform. Okay, so in, in light of uh, artificial intelligence, what does this mean as, uh, as we work in, uh, in the field? This basically means uh, several things. Uh, for example, uh, there, there has to be, of course, uh, a more awareness on on privacy. Engineers should learn should learn more, and companies should invest on making their uh, technical team aware of the privacy concerns that are there. Uh, one of the exercises that, uh, or one of the basically techniques that can be used, is that. Uh, uh, for the for the team of data scientists, for example, to think about or to do the motivated intruder test. So to think of if if there is an intruder with a malicious intent and they have this data exist in this form, in this shape, what they might be doing. And if you can come up with few ideas of what they can do with this data, in this format, you can start then develop or uh, basically uh, practice some techniques that makes reaching these goals or, or, or these kind of use cases difficult if intruder uh, get the data. Uh, but in general, the most important uh, part uh, that, uh, in, uh, for, for, data, for artificial intelligence is first data minimization. So their companies usually will collect huge amounts of data. And with this huge amount of data, there is uh, basically personal data and other identifiers that are or might not be uh, personal, but they can, uh, they can uh, they basically someone can infer who is the individual behind X, Y, Z pieces of data. For example, things like gender, uh, gender, zip code, and uh, 
uh, maybe other things like level of education or something. Stuff that might not be your name and your IC or passport number, but they still, if they use this information, they can infer uh, who the individual might be. So data min minimization uh, aims to, uh, to minimize collection of, uh, of this data. And in the same time, uh, uh, instead of uh, hoarding all that amount of data just to look and use the data that are relevant to the use case uh, uh, that, uh, that's uh, in the project. Uh, the second thing means there is a huge need for enhancing the identification techniques. So uh, as we have personal data, one of the ways is to basically anonymize it. But these anonymization techniques has to be in a level where uh, reverse engineering the process to get to the actual data become hard. And uh, there are multiple techniques uh, that we will talk about uh, on this, but this is basically what it means that uh, there has to be enhanced uh, the identification techniques uh, implemented or adopted by uh, the AI team or in the AI product. And third, explain the logic behind automated decisions. Uh, and uh, so this puts uh, light into interpretability of artificial intelligence. How did, uh, how did, for example, whenever the AI is involved in making decision about people, uh, it is uh, required uh, even by the GDPR to give information on the logic involved. Uh, on top of that, uh, Basically, it has uh, to provide explanation of the reason behind the decision and to keep track of the meaningfulness of uh, prediction. <clears throat> now, how, how or, or what are the techniques that can be used to enhance privacy while still preserving utility? There are three techniques that I will share here. So the first technique is the identification using, uh, basically the identification means obscuring personally identifying information. For example, if we have uh, names, uh, how can we de-identify the names of our users? There are three techniques uh, that are mentioned here for simplicity. So for example, if we have three names of people, we have, uh, uh, Basically, one way is that we can use substitution. This substitution, for example, can say person A, person B, person C, or it can say, for example, name of a person or anything that makes it really hard to identify who uh, this specific individual is. Another way, it could be by uh, taking basically the first, uh, this is a regular expression. It just shows, for simplicity, it shows like, if, uh, if your name is Lionel Carr, then it will take the L and K of the first letter. And then it will become very hard to know LK stands for what. Or you can even look at it from a different, uh, a different way where you can randomly pick one letter from the first name and one letter from the second name and use this as a representative of this person. And in this way, you can see that it is uh, pretty hard to, uh, to, to read the process or to look at who, it, who or what was the actual name of the person. Uh, the last is pseudo-random tokenization. So you can use uh, any kind of uh, algorithm or technique that will generate a gibberish of uh, text or uh, basically characters and numbers that... Uh, uh, basically in substitution or to refer to these names. That's uh, the simple level that we can do for the identification and mostly this will be for personally identifying information. Something like names or for example you have the full name or passport number or uh, national uh, ID number. This is uh, pretty much 
uh, can uh, do a lot in hiding this information or making them uh, hard. Uh, even in the case of a breach or anything, it will not be very useful as it does not refer to a specific individual. The second technique is K-anonymization. K-anonymization stands on, uh, on the concept that uh, there is uh, several studies basically saying that uh, about 87% 80 of population is uniquely identifiable by zip code, birth date, and gender. The percentage will change from a country to another. However, the same thing stands that uh, there is a potential of identifying individuals based on uh, what is called uh, quasi identifiers. Identifiers that does not, it, it's not in the same level as the person's name and the person's uh, national ID number, but they are still identifiers, uh, identify, uh, identifiers that can bring you closer to know about the identity of a person. The key anonymization concept uh, says basically, uh, that we should make, uh, so instead of keeping these values unique, we should uh, basically make every record we have has some similarity to a K number uh, of other records in, in the system. So for example, if you look here, every individual here has a, a unique, uh, uh, basically you can say uh, data. And what the K anonymization says is that for this group of data, uh, or for this group of individuals, we should make their quasi-identifiers to be similar. So you cannot refer to one person because there are four people who look similar in this case. And if you make that across uh, the entire data, what happens is that the identity of this individual is obscured on uh, basically this level of uh, an anonymization technique you used. The third technique is to use, for example, federated learning. And you see here how the three, uh, the three techniques are addressing to different level of challenge. Uh, the first technique is basically, uh, basically try to obscure personal identifier. And the second one, try to protect against if there is anyone will reverse engineer the quasi identifiers to know to to identify the individuals, the second technique work on them. But the third technique here, federated learning, addresses a new level of a problem, and this problem mostly happens. It's it's uh, it's an AI uh, problem. Uh, for example, if an AI algorithm that is deployed in a medical scenario, it needs to, to reach a clinical grade of accuracy. And uh, what does this mean is that, so for an individual to be considered a medical expert in a med in specific uh, or particular medical field, that, uh, that person needs to have 15, persons, uh, 15 years of experience on this job. And such an expert has probably read about 15,000 cases in a year, which means in 15 year, uh, years, this person will have looked into 225,000 cases. Now, when you consider, when you consider a, a rare disease that uh, affects uh, you know, a very small uh, proportion of the people, then even an expert with uh, 30 years of experience will only have seen roughly hundreds or few thousands of cases in that particular condition. Now, AI comes here to be an intermediary where it can be an expert in this very rare condition. But to make this AI expert, we need to expose it to uh, a big number of cases. Now, the big number of cases will not be possible uh, uh, to have it into one place because it could be 
uh, this number of cases uh, uh, available across maybe a, a few regions or countries, for example, where regulations prevent these uh, institutions, uh, for example, from sharing this data. Or in another way is that there is a lot of personal data in these medical records where the organization itself cannot exchange this information with another uh, institution, another medical institution. So federated learning comes to uh, solve this problem by basically training artificial intelligence alg uh, algorithm across decentralized devices or servers holding samples of data without exchanging those samples. So if you look here in, in, in the diagram here, uh, let's assume we have a community hospital, a research medical center, and a cancer treatment uh, center. Now, each one of them has thousands of cases because they have accumulated this number of cases across uh, decades uh, and across uh, maybe uh, some of them are in, uh, for example, a bigger, uh, a bigger city or they have a higher population and that makes them uh, diverse in that. Uh, another thing is that for this AI algorithm, it has to be able to see a lot more data. So a variety of uh, environmental conditions, genders, uh, people of different places generally. And if we can perform that training across multiple uh, or data collected from multiple uh, institutions, then uh, we have a better uh, chance to basically solve uh, this problem. Now, the federated uh, learning will basically be performed by using a federated server. Now, the federated server here, it will train on maybe, or it will have a global model that is too generic. It does not contain any kind of personal data, and it will share this copy of the model with the community hospital. Now, the community hospital will perform training on their own hardware and on their own data. And this uh, model will be trained on uh, basically diverse data here. And after that, the community hospital will share the model back to the federated server. Now, the, now what is shared is just the model, the parameters uh, that basically uh, uh, that are created after the learning or after the training. There is no personal data that is shared. The federated server can do the same and share it with the research medical center and with the cancer treatment center and collect these parameters that at the end, uh, basically all of these three institutions contributed into training one algorithm without the need to... Uh, exchange the data between them or basically uh, bring the data to a different place. The data is still in the same organization, it's still in their private uh, uh, premise, but the learning uh, can happen. And for that, it can, as you see, bring, uh, it can bring uh, basically a huge promise for the medical field where there are a lot more regulations that prevent AI uh, from being used in the level uh, it could uh, achieve good things for humanity. Now, these are not on, uh, the only techniques uh, that are there. These techniques can be applied to uh, some organizations and firms out there, but some others might not be able to uh, basically uh, implement them. There are other techniques that I want to refer uh, to here. Uh, one is differential privacy. Differential privacy is basically a randomized algorithm that takes a data set as an input and output some results that expected to be reason uh, to reasonably approximate the analysis. In a way, uh, basically imagine that there is this uh, there is this algorithm in the middle. And when you give it a data set that contains private data, this algorithm will basically up generate, uh, generate basically an analysis that reasonably or give you an output of the data that uh, 
that can help you regenerate the analysis uh, with a decent approximation level. So in a way, all the details are obscured and in the same time, you can uh, see the same analysis without uh, you know, exposing that uh, private data. Another technique uh, as well in here is the local differential privacy. Now, a local differential privacy basically looks at, uh, it, it's an advanced family of techniques. It enable, mostly it's used in surveys. So it enable individuals to credibly deny content of their uh, records. So uh, for example, uh, where it, so the technique can be implemented, for example, in a survey where it can, uh, uh, for example, guide you to answer yes and no, or I don't know, to certain questions. And as a result of this, that your answers cannot be strongly, uh, uh, you know, leads to the individual. Like the individual can completely deny that uh, they are behind these answers because of the, the way uh, basically the algorithm have uh, have randomized certain uh, certain answers and third uh, using a, a fully or using a fully uh, using a fully uh, homomorphic encryption this technique is basically comes back again to training uh, 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 to training or even performing an analysis uh, in a different device. And what's happening is that the data will be encrypted. And let's say the artificial intelligence algorithm will learn from it, or you can carry on any kind of uh, uh, computations on this data and without the need to decrypt this data. And it provides uh, basically a way for a lot of organizations, for example, some organization will uh, want to do certain, uh, uh, let's say in a, in a real use case, there could be a certain organization that want to train an AI model, or they want to do some kind of analysis, but they don't have the resources for. So they might, uh, uh, they, they might look at cloud providers, for example, but due to regulation, they can't use cloud provider. Uh, they can't move the data. Now, if using the FHE technique, they can basically uh, encrypt this data and generate a new data that's completely encrypted and no one can identify anything on it. And they can perform this training on uh, a third party that they don't trust and without the need to basically decrypt this data again uh, for the training. And from that, they did not have to, uh, you know, like uh, uh, go against the regulation. And in the same time, they don't have to, for example, invest in hardware uh, uh, in, uh, in premise uh, to do this. They can actually do it using the same resources like cloud provider, but the data is still uh, protected and it can't be identified or it can't uh, basically uh, be exposed. Okay, in general, there are best practices for data teams or AI teams and organizations uh, to adopt uh, uh, from, uh, from now on. One is that they should define the purpose of using the data. This is one of the requirements of the GDPR and it's referred to as purpose, uh, as purpose limitations. So instead of collecting data and then later on figure out what value and what can come up from them, uh, defining the purpose means uh, whenever you are deciding to collect the data, you should define the purpose for it. Uh, another uh, another uh, technique or another practice is to implement a data expiration policy. And maybe you have heard lately how Google sent you a message that says, you can choose for how long you will you want to keep your uh, your data or they think the data that you deleted and so the benefit of this is that even though 
Storing data is very cheap today, but in case of breach, this, this is going to be very expensive and might expose the company to financial liability. So by implementing a data expiration policy, what you are doing is you are limiting the data to be used uh, uh, only for a specific period of time. And if the person is inactive or they basically decided uh, not to come to the platform anymore within, uh, for example, 12 months, 16 months, uh, this data will all be erased. The third uh, best practice is to minimize the level of details. So a minimization policy restrict the granularity of personal data collected. So for example, today, uh, many of the companies can know, or many of the products actually, collecting data that can know the type of phone you use, the career you, uh, uh, or basically the provider you use, uh, how far are you from the IP address, what is your IP address, the size of your screen, and so much of these details that at certain cases for certain products, it's not necessary. So implementing a policy that minimize the level of details, especially those that are not going to be used for anything, is going to protect, basically, uh, reduce the granularity and at the same time protect this personal data as since the organization and uh, the product are not going to benefit from it, therefore there is no need to uh, be collecting such uh, details. <clears throat> so these are uh, the, all the points that I have uh, f to share with you today. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, share with me on, on the, in the Q&A or the questions part here. Uh, what would you say are common misconceptions uh, about AI? Yeah, so one of the misconceptions that I have until lately is that interpretability is close to impossible when using very advanced uh, techniques. For example, if we are using deep learning, there are billions of computations that takes place to arrive to a decision or a prediction. And if you look at, like, the GDPR uh, requires you to uh, tell the user or, or give basically uh, an explanation of how this prediction is made. And I think many, especially working in the AI uh, field, uh, will have this misconception that interpretation of the decision and prediction is, uh, is not possible. But uh, it is actually possible. There are techniques used for that, there are varying techniques and it, some techniques approach are from, for example, uh, just like for the technical audience in here, for example, if you trained, uh, if you trained uh, what they call it, uh, if you trained a deep learning algorithm uh, and it has a certain level of, uh, for example, uh, uh, accuracy, and now you want to basically create a layer of interpretability, you can use uh, you can use, uh, for example, these the features that are fed to the last fully connected neural network, and instead of feeding it to fully connected neural network, you can feed them into a decision tree, and decision tree is uh, uh, basically it has a decent interpretability. In, uh, actually, it's uh, one of the best techniques for interpretability, as you can even draw the levels of decision uh, that the algorithm has taken to arrive to the prediction. Um, what is your opinion in inverse privacy? Uh, honestly, I don't have much uh, much knowledge uh, on this. I didn't go uh, through it. 
I, I think only lately that I looked into into uh, privacy. There is a course for those who are interested or working in the field. I think the course is in Coursera, and it is dedicated for uh, AI and data science professionals who are interested to learn more about privacy uh, in AI. So yeah, I'm, uh, I took interest on, on, on this side actually uh, uh, not so long ago, and I don't have much idea about inverse privacy. Uh, purpose taxonomy is available. Uh, can you clarify on that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, basically. Uh, for example, if we if we are having, uh, let's say, a pay now uh, or sorry, a buy now pay later product, uh, for example, and if you have a product uh, like that where uh, basically people will uh, buy now, you kind of giving them a loan and you will take uh, uh, or you will get paid on, on as a platform in the next three months. Now. Different products will, or different companies can go about collecting this differently. Some of the organizations, for example, they will, uh, they are stand alone, so they do, they will depend on some kind of credit scoring to to look at how uh, how uh, how likely they should. For example, if they have a thousand dollar max uh, limit, then they might look at your credit score and say, like, okay, based on how risky you are. Uh, we will give you a certain, a certain basically a limit. Now, when it's a standalone, or uh, when it's a standalone, uh, for example, a product like this, they might be uh, some uh, certain organizations or certain products will look into. When you are making this application, they will ask you for various things. So they will ask you, for example, about uh, your address, how big is your family, how many is your siblings, and so on. And you see that. The the uh, the purpose of of the service they are offering is not necessarily uh, you know correlate to the amount of data they are collecting from you. Now, in in regarding like uh, like a purpose taxonomies, I'm I'm not quite sure if if uh, if they if there is details on this about uh, on, uh, on on for example the GDPR, but I. I somehow think that I have read something similar in the GDPR. And uh, yeah, I think that will be a good resource to get uh, more clarity on, on purpose uh, taxonomies and what can or, or what organization are allowed uh, to collect uh, and whatnot. Uh, one, one thing that is clear on this, uh, 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 on purpose taxonomies is that uh, they sh uh, organization should declare why they collect it or, or why are they collecting this specific data and they should not be using it for uh, other purpose without your consent so if the organization ended up like offering a new product and they want to use uh, some of your data for it by uh, by the, the, G the gdpr they are required to uh, to basically come back to the user and ask them that uh, we want to use your data for, uh, for example, this uh, new purpose. And it is upon the user uh, consent that uh, they can say yes, uh, or they can use it or not. Okay, increasing use of AI in a library by China, will they be the next item? Oh, um, I'm not, um, I'm not really quite sure, but Certainly, uh, China has uh, has a lot of uh, products, and some of them are worrisome in inside of uh, AI. And in the same time, when we come to talk about privacy, uh, I mean, like when you bring 
a state level uh, kind of uh, products and services, and then you say privacy. It's uh, well, I the least I would say it's 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 touchy because it's, at some places of the world uh, there is only one party that makes policies. So and on some others, well, I mean, like for example, like. Uh, I would say like the GDPR, it came from, uh, for example, in the U EU and all companies have uh, to basically abide by it and all uh, individuals. And even if you have a startup that will offer certain service in the EU, for example, you are, you are still required to fulfill that. But when, when, you, have, when you have a state uh, level kind of uh, uh, kind of the way in China that the, the state provides certain services. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how these uh, privacy uh, things are carried out there. <laughs> okay. Okay, I think uh, these are all the questions here. Uh, thank you, everyone.